Okay, so I'm here with uh, Simon Bennett, who's a, a strength and conditioning coach for the NHL. And, and Simon, what I want to do is, is just talk about the idea of strength, but really the idea of strength based upon kind of an athletic endeavor. And what I'd love for you to do is just kind of take us through your approach, your thought process when it comes to strength. Uh, kind of what you see with your athletes when you know when they when they do strength exercises, let's say in the gym or in an athletic endeavor, and how that may or may not transfer over. So what I may do is just is get you to simply just talk about your ideas of strength and what you kind of see in your environments. Sure. Um, well, I mean, yeah, strength. I mean, is is one of those sort of hotly debated topics in terms of what it exactly means and and the definition behind it. I'm sure that you know we can get into a lot of sort of different definitions relative to what it means to us and, and the world we may be operating in at that particular time. But I think that something that's become very clear to me is uh, in the short amount of time that I've been, you know, working with elite athletes and, and uh, working uh, at the NHL level is that, is that, you know, strength is really relative to mobility and stability. And, 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 and what I've seen and experienced, you know, relative to individuals who are going through a tremendous amount of stress and, and, and pattern overload and, and, and you know, the, the rigors of a travel schedule combined with, you know, uh, time zone changes and all the rest of it, all these demands that get encompassed with, you know, the, the stress of the game is that, is that really, um, you know, we start to see, uh, the, you know, the effects of this relative to, you know, fatigue and, and, and how that shapes itself relative to, you know, strength that they need to survive in their game. And, and so a lot of what we do on an in-season perspective is, is things relative to trying to reestablish um, mobility. Things like, you know, movement patterning uh, becomes a huge part of, of what we would typically describe as being strength training. But more importantly, looking at trying to build strength from the inside out. And so a lot of the, the, the things that we engage in as a, as a team from an in-season perspective might be very different from what a lot of people are typically used to doing and, and possibly depending on the environment that you're in, uh, might be somewhat surprising. So uh, we, we have that sort of that inside-out approach to, to how we, we try to build strength for a player, say, on an in-season perspective. But we can get into a long conversation about in-season versus off-season, the differences and so forth, as we look at strength and, and how we would maybe you know deal with that whole issue of strength. Yeah, and I think the big thing for me personally is, is you know, when we come out of school, we learn that strength really is a certain definition, and it's really geared towards more of what we might describe as kind of a, a maximal absolute strength uh, as, as a description or definition. But, you know, gosh, as we start to think about how many different ways in which we need to produce force, there's all these different environments in which we need to kind of be quote-unquote strong. And, you know, I think taking lessons from unique uh, athletic endeavors, uh, environments, certainly talking to you and seeing the players and what they can do kind of in the gym, so to speak, and what they can do on the ice, is there, there's a gap between the two. And, and you always talk, talk to me about a couple of players that you know personally that you've trained that don't have gym strength. I mean, they can't do a bench press. They can't do a squat to save their life. But some of these players have scored more goals in their career in front of the net, you know, in high traffic areas with people trying to shove them out of the way and they just simply can't move that these other athletes, uh, you know, so there's a difference between strength, let's say, on the ice in that environment and, you know, strength in the gym. And it doesn't mean that one is correct and one is incorrect. I think what it means, though, is that we need to broaden our scope when it comes to how we define strength and how that may authentically transfer into a given environment. No, absolutely. I, I, I think what you're kind of, you know, leaning towards is really this whole issue of dynamic strength, which is, you know, dynamic stability and and, and, you know, we can, I can look at a player and say, geez, you know, this player doesn't look very strong, but yet if I put him in a situation like an athletic environment, um, as, you, as you kind of pointed out, um, their ability to be strong or be able to gain position, say, in front of the net, depending on what they're doing on the ice, but, or either protecting a puck, for example, from another player, and their ability to generate very strong angles and, and balance and stability, and these are all sort of things that, that you and I have been working on relative to understanding what demands are confronting a, a you know a hockey player's example, but I think you can carry that through into most almost all sports. Um, but but angling and body position and 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 maintaining dynamic strength and stability um, while sort of performing sort of a multitude of tasks and skating and stick handling and shooting and so forth, all of these things comprised right 
Um, you know, it's really tough to, to put a handle on exactly what, what strength really means, but you, 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 you sort of understand it better by the players that seem to be able to survive best in the game, i.e. the best players on the ice. And, you know, there's a lot of players in the NHL that we talk about all the time about, you know, what is it about those players that, that give them such success and ability on the ice? And, um, you know, how does a 170-pound player play in the NHL and a 250-pound guy doesn't seem to have the strength and stability on their skates. And, and what, what are the biggest differences relative to those two individuals? And, you know, seemingly if we look at size or physical size, we say, well, automatically the assumption should be that the 250-pounder right. should have greater strength, greater weight. He does have greater strength in certain environments or certain positions, but yet when you put them in a dynamic environment, all of a sudden it becomes the great equalizer. So our definition of strength becomes very... Uh, you know, becomes very ambiguous in terms of how you define it out. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I think a lot of times what we think about as strength is the ability for a muscle to, you know, to, to have an action potential being received into the muscle. And then, you know, we kind of think of this thing, Benny, where, you know, it's the shortening of the muscle that, that pulls on the bone, and that is really the definition of strength. Well, that may be a part of the conversation, but, you know, gosh, when, when you look at some of these athletes, especially these hockey players that are on the ice, you know, what makes them strong is positional stability. You know, can yeah. they have can they have end range stability? And if they can, then then they can generate more force uh, because their bodies are at the right place at the right time. And so, you know, I think part of the, the conversation is that it's a little bit more confusing than than just to simplify it into, yeah. you know, here's a weight, here's a linear load path. And let's see how much you can actually concentrically force that muscle to move that weight, and then that's it. You know, gosh, you know, you, you've you talked about these these players on the ice that are in different positions. They they attain different angles, and they're they're bloody strong. And you know, you and I saw that in the first years of Viper when we looked at these farm kids, and yeah. they were strong because of not just their musculature. They weren't even the biggest athletes or biggest players or biggest individuals. They just seem to have this better pre-stressed body that was always stable, and and their connective tissue seemed to be a lot stronger. Now, you know, there's dietary factors in that as well, but you know, it it really is interesting to to analyze that from the pers- perspective of traditional models of what we thought strength was. No, abs- absolutely, and I mean, there, there's some physical things that that I do know uh, in working with players, and um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, when you look at the the size of the you know, the ass end of a player, if you could use that word as yep. an example. We're, that, we're using that it now. Tends, that, t- <laughs> <laughs> that tends to indicate that, you know, he's got a, a very low center of gravity, and I think low center of gravity obviously lends itself to, you know, a better position in order which to create strength. Um, so th- that seems to be a common trait that I would note from a physical perspective. So when we see a player come in and they've got, you know, fairly – uh, you know, sort of underdeveloped girth to, to the leg area, I mean, it becomes an automatic red flag as to whether this player is going to be strong enough to be able to survive the game at this level. But having said that, compositionally, you can never make that assumption. So, uh, but, but I think that there's a tremendous number of demands that the player faces, and it's those individuals that, that can create the greatest amount of strength in that dynamic environment uh, that, that – that I would quote unquote define as being the strongest players, right? Yeah, and having big legs in and of itself doesn't mean much if we cannot no. if we cannot blend that with mobility. I mean, you and I saw a lot of young kids, a lot of young players that couldn't get into the deep knee position. You know, they may be able to hold it for a certain amount of time, but they couldn't move from that position. No, and, and yeah, and I, and I think you're, you're you're absolutely right, Michelle. That that you know, when you look at there, there's some players, right? That Typically, um, you know, I, I would suggest have very knee dominant ma- movement patterns, um, which, and we talk a lot about the importance of a hockey player in terms of being able to have three dimensional hip movement capability. Once we start to see some degree or loss of the ability to extend the hip properly, you know, due to the pattern overload that, that the player is encompassing on a daily basis, then we start to see an alteration in terms of movement patterns. So as you begin to move further and further away, from how the body works best, that's when you start to see a player or an athlete getting weaker. And so that's something that we're very, very acutely aware of relative to in-season because we're always trying to work to try and circumvent that. So not necessarily provide additional strength gains to a player, but try to maintain what they do have by 
keeping the body moving properly and, and establishing really healthy movement patterns so that they can maintain some of these really important variables that we sort of define around this whole concept of strength.